So yes, this morning we're talking about the return of crown preference um, and also the fact that the prescribed part also got slightly smaller. The return of crown preference is imminent. Um, it's coming in at the end of this month on the 1st of December. And it's what I'm calling a, a, a binary change. It is being um, turned on immediately on that date. It's not being phased in and it will apply to all insolvencies, corporate insolvencies and personal insolvencies that start on the 1st of December or on a later date. And we are going to have two tiers of preferential creditors to deal with. There will be ordinary preferential debts and there will be secondary preferential debts. Uh, the HMRC claims will be secondary preferential debts and they will rank behind the primary preferential claims, which are mainly employees' claims, and those are not changing. I think also um, financial services compensation claims can also rank as, as preferential, but they're fairly uh, esoteric and unusual. The classes of crown debt that will be preferential um, are VAT, PAYE deductions, including repayments of student loans that should be deducted from wages and salary, and employee contributions to national insurance, um, and also construction industry scheme deductions where tax is deducted at schools. Um, if you've got your notes in front of you, you'll see that I those, those refer to a statutory instrument yet seen. We've now got that. It was laid um, in September and its statutory instrument 983 of 2020 that confirms uh, the commencement date and the classes of creditors. Now, I've, I've said that this is, if you like, a, a, a binary change to the law um, because it will apply to all insolvencies that start from the 1st of December or afterwards. And the claim will include um, those types of HMRC debts that are preferential, no matter how old they are and no matter what the size of them is. Now, this is a change from Crown Preference as we used to know it, where under previous Crown Preference, uh, there were caps on how much HMRC could claim, how far back they could go, uh, which meant that you didn't have to look at the distant past of the company. Now, I'm, I'm wondering if perhaps there may be a small surge in appointments this month um, as people get CBLs across the line just before the end of the month to avoid the complexity of having to deal with a second tier of, of preferential claims. Um, complexity always carries a cost um, and no doubt you'll be looking at your fee estimates for cases where you're expecting to be appointed after the 1st of December where you may have additional costs in terms of dealing with HMRC preferential claims. Now, in the current climate, HMRC tax claims, preferential claims, could actually be very substantial um, because, of course, with VAT, we've had this right to defer that's been in place since the 20th of March to the 30th of June. Um, and that's either going to be a tax which will then be all payable at the end of March uh, next year, at, uh, or which will be um, paid in instalments after that. And with PAYE, there are many time to play sorry, time to pay arrangements in place. So again, the arrears could actually be very substantial. Um, so we could be looking even from the 1st of December with some really quite significant uh, secondary preferential claims that we're having to deal with. And I've got a note here to remind me to, to mention again the next uh, Coffee Break video briefing next month, which will be on Schedule 13 to this year's Finance Act. And those are the provisions which can impose personal liability on directors and other people involved in company management. Uh, and ownership for HMRC debts. Um, that is already in force. We'll be talking about that next month. One of the issues that I think we 
will need to look at with uh, pre preferential claims is the possibility of contingent liabilities. And there's a couple of examples as I've, I've seen recently, which are just illustrative of the sort of problems that we might have. Uh, for example, you could find that a property was sold years and years ago, um, and everybody involved had failed to spot that at some point in the distant past, the, uh, the property had been registered for VAT. So they'd forgotten to charge VAT on the selling price. It's now too late to ask the buyer to pay another 20% on top of what they have already paid for the property. And there's now a very significant VAT liability. That would all fall in as a preferential claim once it's identified. Another example was um, a business that was paying its subcontractors gross. Um, it turned out that one of the main subcontractors it was paying had an exemption certificate uh, that had expired and therefore they should have been deducting tax from the payments of that subcontractor. They didn't know the exemption certificate had expired. Um, it was a genuine and honest mistake. There's not much they could have done about it. Um, and as a consequence of that, the company has got a very large amount of PAY that it owes to HMRC. These are the sorts of problems that we may well see in dealing with HMRC preferential claims. And they could be very long established um, ones that go back very many years. Let's look at some of the particular uh, types of procedures and see some of the specific issues that we might have to face with some of those. I'll look at CDAs first of all. Um, now, the effect of the legislation here is, of course, as you would expect, preferential debts have priority over non-preferential debts. And ordinary preferential debts have priority over secondary preferential debts within their class. And as you would expect, all preferential debts rank equally. And if you try and change that in the CVA proposal, um, it, it is possible to do, but any preferential creditor who votes against the proposal will effectively veto it. And I think we can expect HMRC to be alert to that um, and to exercise their, their, their veto when they think it is appropriate to do so. Now, the effect of this is that I think that CVA proposals will have to provide for a 100 pence dividend to HMRC. Um, I, I remember having a number of conversations with Dick Ivory when he was in charge of HMRC's uh, voluntary arrangement service about this, in that I thought that as long as um, HMRC were paid in priority, they would be free to accept less than 100 pence in the pound. Um, he disagreed with me and he thought that the the only circumstance in which um, HMRC uh, would agree a voluntary arrangement where they had preferential status was where they were getting 100 pence a pound. And from his perspective, the only discretion that he had got was about how long um, they, they would allow the debtor to, to pay them, how long the CBA would last and how credible they thought the proposals were. I'm sure that HMRC will be taking a very similar approach again, and therefore um, CBA proposals will have to pay for a uh, 100 points dividend to HMRC. And I've got a warning there about the November 2020 adjournment trap. And this could be relevant to you if you have got a CBA that's up for approval towards the end of November. Assuming that you, you've got a, approval by a, a virtual meeting, uh, which is always sensible because you can adjourn a virtual meeting if you need to. If you do adjourn the virtual meeting with the result that the creditors approve the CBA in December rather than November, then the relevant date for preferential claims <laughs> CBAs is set by reference to the date that the proposal is approved. So by adjourning a November meeting into December in the CBA, 
you could find that you have to completely rework your estimated outcome statement to recognize crown preference. And particularly if there's a significant crown play, that could have um, a dramatic effect on the dividends that ordinary unsecured creditors are getting and could affect the chances of getting the CVA approved at the adjourned meeting. And of course, the, the other effect on CVAs is going to be these, this possibility of uh, unforeseen contingent claims coming in. Um, and it won't just be that um, a big unexpected VAT or PAYE claim um, will dilute the dividend. It, it could be that it would almost completely wipe out the dividend for ordinary unsecured creditors. Um, and that could be uh, a sort of significant change to the effect of the CVA. Let's look at administrations as well and the effect here. Um, first of all, if you need to extend um, an administration. Now, if you have got an administration where you're not expecting to pay a dividend to ordinary unsecured creditors, but where there is going to be the prospect of a dividend to the preferential creditors, then you will need consent for the extension from the secured creditors and also from the preferential creditors. Now, with secured creditors, you will need express consent from each of the creditors. For the consent from preferential creditors, the good news here is that you can use deemed consent to get that consent, um, which is probably um, a prudent thing to do. It gets rather tighter when it comes to getting your remuneration approved in administration. Now, of course, the basic position with getting remuneration approved in administration is that if you're not a committee, it's the committee who sets the remuneration. Um, if you don't have um, a committee, then it will be the creditors. And again, if you've got an administration where you're not expecting to pay a dividend to unsecured creditors, but there is a prospect of a dividend to preferential creditors, then it's the creditors, the preferential creditors, who will then have to approve your remuneration, which means HMRC. And you cannot use deemed consent for this, you will need a decision procedure. So you will actually need HMRC to vote for your remuneration to get it approved by uh, this procedure in these cases. Now, that leaves the question as to whether HMRC will actually be engaged in these types of administrations and whether they will be geared up for considering your proposals for remuneration, um, whether you'll get a response from them, um, and whether they might take um, perhaps a different view to remuneration than we've seen from, from creditors recently. It might well be the case that if you've got uh, an administration of that sort where it's HMRC who are going to be controlling your remuneration, that you might want to try particularly hard to get um, a committee established um, fairly early on before you, you uh, uh, get your, your remuneration set. Let's move on to the prescribed part. Um, this is a change that is already in force, except that unlike the change to uh, crown preference, which is a binary switch which will be flicked on the 1st of December. This is a phased change um, where it is going to be gradual over time and it will probably take um, possibly three or four years before we start to see um, it becoming particularly significant. And that's because the change to the prescribed part, the increase to the prescribed part amount maximum from 600,000 to 800,000 will apply only to cases where the floating charge was created after the 6th of April this year. 
on or after the 6th of April. So you'll need when opening the file to look at um, the first ranking floating charge on the company, which will normally be the oldest floating charge, but if there's a deed of priority, it may not be the oldest one. Um, and you'll have to check the date of that to see what the prescribed part applicable to the case is. If it's a very old floating charge before the 14th of September 2003, um, then there is no prescribed part. Um, between 16th of September 2003 and the 5th of April this year, the prescribed part remains at 600,000. But if the first ranking floating charge is dated the 6th of April or later, um, it then uh, has a, a prescribed part of £800,000 um, deducted from the floating charge fund to be paid to the unsecured creditors. In terms of other issues, um, the minimum value to the prescribed part is still £10,000, so there's no prescribed part if the floating charge fund is less than £10,000. I'm just going to go back to the issue of remuneration because I've I've got a question in from uh, from Chris Tate, which um, is, is is visible to everybody. And Chris is asking whether primary and secondary preferential creditors will be grouped together for the purposes of a decision procedure. Um, and I have to say, I'm not entirely sure. I think. Um, from what I've seen of Schedule B1, unless they've changed Schedule B1, um, I think the preferential creditors are grouped together as a single class for this rather than primary or secondary. But I, I think I'll have to ha have a look at that. Um, and of course, the, the, the implication there is that if HMRC are, are not responding to your request for a decision, but you've got two or three employees who can, um, then if those employees approve your remuneration and HMRC don't answer, then you've got your remuneration um, approved. So I, I think, but I will check this point, I think it is the case that um, for these purposes, all preferential creditors will be treated as a single class um, and there will be just one class meeting of all preferential creditors. So anyway, back to the uh, prescribed part um, and the uh, the, the size of it. As I said, the minimum value of the prescribed part is still £10,000, so there is no prescribed part if the floating charge fund is less than that. Um, and the percentages are still the same, which is 50% of the first £10,000 and then 20% of the rest. Um, and the maximum size that will be paid out as the prescribed part is, is, is £800,000. Uh, as opposed to £600,000 before. So in slightly shorter time than anticipated, I've now covered all of the points that I, I wanted to talk about on this. Um, um, and I'll now open up for any more questions if anybody's got any. So uh, questions, please. Uh, and if not, then I'll take the opportunity to say uh, thank you all very much for coming along to this.